Good morning. Thank you very much for being here. If you can walk, you can dance. If you can talk, you can sing. In other words, we are all artists. In other words, shut up and dance. Today I'm going to tell you three true stories. The first story begins when I was 36 years old, broken, just divorced, unemployed, and living in a new city, San Francisco, where I knew few people. I had the quintessential midlife crisis. Actually, it was more of a nervous breakdown. All I wanted was love, a family, and creative success. I had none of them. In the throes of this darkness, I began to paint because I enjoyed the movement and the lawlessness of it. I was failing repeatedly to meet a woman that I connected with, so I decided to create a silhouette of the woman that I desired. Strong and sexy and confident. I perfected this stencil and then for two years I painted her. If you looked very closely, you'd notice that the actual outline of each figure was the word now painted over and over in my finest brush. Now, because time was of the essence. I made 35 of these paintings over two years. And a month or so after finishing the series, I met someone. She was bright, cute, funny, successful. She even lived on a houseboat in Sausalito, just over the Golden Gate Bridge. But most amazingly of all, she looked exactly like the figure in my paintings. In fact, if she stood before the canvas, it was as if I had made a chalk outline of her body. I married that woman, and she remains my wife 13 years later. The second story begins when we returned from our honeymoon to discover that we were pregnant. My wife and I shared a deep and lifelong excitement to have children, and we were elated to know that we would soon be three on our floating home. Sadly, we had a miscarriage at nine weeks. Unfortunate, but hardly tragic. These things happen all the time. We carried on with our lives, mine as a painter, she as an advertising executive, and within a few months, we were pregnant again. Again, excitement and eagerness to move to the next phase of our lives. But then, unexpectedly, another miscarriage after a few months. This one hurt, literally and figuratively, with my wife suffering considerable pain, both emotional and physical. Luckily, within a few months, we were pregnant again, and this time it stuck. At 18 weeks, we got a glowing review at the doctor. You are perfectly healthy with the risk factors of a 20-year-old, the doctor told my 38-year-old wife. And it's a boy. A boy. Wow. A few days later, I was out of town when my wife called. She was hysterical. It's gone, she wailed, for no apparent reason. During a routine ultrasound, she learned there was no heartbeat. We lost that baby at 19 weeks. It's gone. Blackness fell upon our lives. Total emotional devastation. We asked our friends and our family not to call. I didn't brush my teeth for days. 
The agonizing weeks slowly passed, and after a few brutal months, we reemerged to get on with our lives. Four months later, we decided to try again, and we were pregnant immediately. Getting pregnant was easy. Staying pregnant was our problem. Things were different now. There was no joy in it, just controlled fear. My wife told me point blank, this is the last time. If this pregnancy does not work, I cannot handle it again, physically or mentally. So there it was, an ultimatum. For the single most important event of my life, I faced the very high probability that I would not have biological children. Time slowed down as if we were living in a Dali painting, a bleak landscape where all the clocks were melting. My frustration as the man stemmed from the fact that there was really nothing that I could do to enhance our prospects. I could massage my wife's feet and make dinner, but that's about it. It's all on her. Then, to add insult to injury, at 28 weeks, she had severe pains which required hospitalization. We were at risk for premature birth, they told us. And we were told that she had to be on strict bed rest for the duration of the pregnancy. For the next 12 weeks, she was not to get up off the bed except to go to the toilet. So I became her manservant. I had to be the strong one in this relationship, but my mental state was breaking down as well. In desperation, I went back to the studio. I began a painting called Bounce, as in bouncing baby. It featured colorful, multifaceted balls of joy falling from heaven into the pathways of our lives. The pathways were made of antique Betty Crocker cookbook pages, egg recipes for fertility. I made a series of these works, all while attending to my wife's daily needs, keeping a pitcher of water by her bedside, peeling her oranges, cooking, and cleaning. At 35 weeks, in one of the biggest storms in 50 years, our houseboat nearly sunk. And as I managed this crisis, my wife's water broke. Not like this. I can't do it like this, she said through tears. I grabbed her shoulders. You can do this. I've got you. We rushed to the hospital. And a few hours later, Kai was born. Five weeks early, but perfect. The third story be begins six years later in Miami. We had moved there a few years earlier to have our second child. With my art career limping along, I had to go back to a real job to pay the bills. To keep my creative muscles moving, I'd been writing a book about the experiences I'm sharing with you now. As I was nearing the completion of that book in the summer of 2014, a very clear idea popped into my head. An idea with the intention of ensuring the success of that book. This was a large, hot, red painting called The Best Books Ever Written, in which I would deconstruct all of the literary masterpieces I had ever read and place within them the title page of my book so that it would be infused with the magic of the world's finest literary minds and become one of the best books ever written. I dove into this piece with verve, and then the phone rang. A notable local artist was putting a group show together 
for Art Basel Miami and wanted to invite me into the show. I had not been in a serious show in years, so I was thrilled. Fast forward a few months to the Friday before Art Basel Miami begins. This is the biggest and most illustrious week of art in America. The entire world descends on Miami to see what's what in the art scene. I'm sitting in a coffee house that morning when I received a text from a friend that said, congratulations, that's really great news. I had no idea what he was talking about. So he showed me that the Miami Herald, our local paper, had previewed the group show and called it their pick of the week with a photo of my painting. The show opened that night it was mobbed, and my painting sold for five figures, more than anything I'd ever produced. And my entire career changed on that day. Three stories, each totally true, and some might say magic. But let's look inside of these and try to understand what actually happened and why. You see, it's not magic. It's about a simple, repeated action that allows one's mind to collect itself, reflect, and gain clarity. Because it is in this state of reflection that we are able to examine the patterns of our own behavior. And in that examination, we can discover the things we are doing right and doing wrong. And we can decide to change our behavior accordingly. By committing to a repeated imaginative act, we step out of our daily rigors for a while. And this simple disconnection allows us to create the space within our minds and our hearts to change the course of our actions and thus our outcomes. Now, what do I mean by a repeated imaginative act? I call it moving your arm every day. In my case, that act has been making art, paintings, collages. My process is very repetitive and laborious, and I like that. But you could just as easily be caring for a garden, or playing piano, or putting your boxes of photographs into photo albums. Anything where your thoughts can wander. A simple, manageable task outside of your daily grind. And one that produces a tangible result. A painting, a poem, a photo album, a garden, a meal, a song, better fitness, this way, no matter what happens, you have something to show for your effort. So there is no downside. It is productive time. Of course, the real prize is not the garden, and it's not the painting. It is the resultant self-awareness, the mental clarity, and ultimately, the soul satisfaction that stems from the change in your behavior. When we were in the worst of our miscarriage issues, my wife read the book, Overcoming Life's Disappointments, by Harold Kushner. In it, he writes, when we open our hearts to pain and suffering, we begin to heal, not because suffering is redemptive, but because opening our hearts is. I believe that I have stumbled upon a way to open your heart. And once that door is open, it is far easy, easier for you to walk through it into a new paradigm in which you're living in a more heartfelt, colorful, and satisfying life. So let's look at my first story. Here is a broken guy who's decided to spend a lot of time inside his flat painting the same figure over and over. Why? Because his loneliness has become unbearable 
and he did not know what else to do. He has a specific intention to find a life partner, to find love. And he used that intention as the platform to do something that he enjoyed, to make paintings. So there I was, in my kitchen, with my Café Del Mar music turned up loud, dancing with my canvases for days and weeks and months and years. The paintings were good. In fact, this was really the first meaningful body of work, no pun intended, that I had ever made. But more importantly, those innumerable solitary moments where I was out of my analytical, self-critical self and into my more whimsical self allowed me to observe my behavioral patterns over nearly four decades. And I real realized something very ugly about myself. Until that time, I'd always approached women with a sense of sexual conquest. They were to be won over, and once conquered, my interest evaporated. Even though I told myself I wanted long-term connection, my actions proved otherwise. I finally realized that until I changed my behavior and acted more soulfully, I would never find a soulmate. And so standing before those canvases, I promised myself never to have an empty hookup again. I began to communicate with women without trying to woo them into bed. I listened and I asked questions to learn who they were inside and what they wanted. I was no longer a predator, but a fellow member of the tribe, keen for good company and connection. And as I told you, I met my wife within months of finishing the last painting. Now let's look at the second story. Here I am facing a life without children and a marriage being tested by the utter despair of both parties. Helpless and stir-crazy, I escaped to my studio for an opportunity to do something, anything, to help our situation along, something where I had control. Over several months, the bounce painting resolved itself. Its intention never wavered. It was exclusively designed to bring forth our child. Again, this studio time allowed me to reflect on our situation, to remember just how hard my wife had it. My struggle, while incredibly frustrating, was nothing compared to hers. She was holding on to each moment, physically and mentally, by her fingernails, with a sense of terror just around the corner. It was my job to take care of her to keep her stable so that she could keep our child stable. That was what this painting did. It kept me clear on my mission to protect my wife. That painting hangs in our living room today, a reminder of the toughest journey we've ever taken, and it embodies the incredible gratitude that we both feel as the parents of two magnificent children. And a truly amazing thing happened in the last six months. A friend of mine was over and studying this piece in my home. I told her the story that I've just told you, and then she pointed it out to me. She said, I see what you were doing. There's the three balls that are interrupted, and the, th the third one was very late. In fact, you can see almost the full pregnancy. But then I can see where you ended up with two perfect children in the end. I painted this painting 10 years ago before we had children. I nearly fell over when she said that. Maybe there is some magic in there somewhere. The third story follows directly from the second story. The birth of Kai 
was the most transformative event of my life. To this day, standing here before you, I do not sweat the small stuff because I know what it's like to sweat the big stuff. And more importantly, in the moment where my gratitude exploded with his birth, my ego evaporated. The me, me, me that had been my life for 42 years was replaced by a primal concern for this new being. And I reveled in the knowledge that given the choice between him or me, I would not hesitate to plunge the knife into my own heart. That diminishment of ego cleared the path for my creativity to expand free of external influence so that when that phone call came in 2014, the work that I already had in motion in my mind was pure and clear and mature, fully ripened. There was a great book published a few years ago titled the subtle art of not giving a fuck. When you make something for the sake of itself and really don't care what anyone thinks, you tap into your richest mine of creativity. By the time I made that massive painting, I was making it for myself because it showed up and I liked it. And guess what? It was damn good. So good that it sold on opening night and changed my life forever. It is the reason that I am standing here now. There is a fourth story that has just begun and it flows from the success of the three stories. Now that my life is healed and I'm on my right path, I have pivoted the focus of my intentions no longer is it about me and my success. Now it is about you and your success. It is about healing the world and building bridges, starting in my own country where we've just suffered a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. You can see some of my new works right here on the second floor where I'll be just after this talk. I truly welcome you to join me in dialogue about the narratives of these new works. And I welcome any questions you may have about the stories that I've just told you now. Thank you very much.